Um, for all the educators out there in the world, I'm trying to put together a presentation that essentially takes you through the arc of my experience as a designer, applying all the tools and elements of education towards my creativity, towards my process. But I was one of those misfit children that, you know, never really understood the true value of education. I always just saw it as this thing that I did until I got to go to recess or you know, go play sports. I wish I had a better insight as to what I could have done with my education. And I've embraced that sort of thinking and that thought process and tried to inspire others throughout the path and the things that I've done with my education. And actually most of the education I've, I've had to acquire is, is through sort of self-teaching, understanding that, well, well, I wasn't paying attention in math class uh, when it was important. Now I am paying attention and going back to those, those things. And so I, I wish, you know, that, that simple slide there, I wish someone would have come to me and said, this is Pythagorean theorem. It's not a bunch of numbers. It's not a bunch of algorithms. It's a bunch of stuff that when combined in unison can actually create a system. It can create something actually quite beautiful as you build that library. You add upon it different things. Uh, here I'm just adding dots to make it seem as though it's this lathe, but adding complexity into it. You know, I'm able to play around with different shapes, different random connections. I eventually fill in those shapes and I have fun, but I never, I never am connected to this idea that it was hard to learn. I strive to learn it. And so that, that's been my path as a designer is that I've been just striving and driving and trying to learn as much as possible throughout this process. And uh, I, I take every opportunity to try and educate sort of the youth uh, that, that there is value in all this stuff that you're reading. Uh, don't don't think that there's nothing connected because actually everything does connect. And the more you sit back and look at that, you realize it. Um, if everyone saw Michael Goff's presentation this morning, he talked about the value of drawing. And I cannot underline that anymore. I love tools and I love technology, but I embrace my sketchbook far more. I embrace the process of just diving into my sketchbook, not knowing exactly where it's potentially going to take me but knowing that something will emerge and whether it's something actually drawing or code related or interaction models, I know that something more freeform can result if I'm not allowing the tools to dictate where that process will head. So I'm generally always in this mode of, okay, I have an idea, let's go to my sketchbook. At the beginning, middle, and even towards the end, I dive in there and try and, try and figure out exactly what's going wrong within a process or how I can, how I can push an idea further. Uh, and then I take it to technology, or take it to the actual tools. Um, another sort of thing that I like to um, scaffold my process with is this idea of capture and observe. I love to spend tons of time. Well, I love to spend tons of money on photography equipment, and that's probably one of the perks of actually like now being a career designer or professional is that I spend an inordinate amount of time in art stores and uh, camera stores just trying out new things. And in this process of just wanting to capture and observe life and capture and observe um, sort of the what-if scenarios of photography or of the way in which light happens on objects, I'm always discovering new things. So I am in this mode of trying to then capture the world around me and have that inform the things that I do. So I spend a lot of time getting really close to nature trying to see what are the forms and structures and trying to think about how is the light hitting it and can I look from underneath an object and have it illuminate from behind. Um, I grew up with one of those moms that was like, hey mom I did this and she'd always be like, well what if you did this and what if you tried this and if you did this it might accomplish this effect and that's always carried over with me and that, that idea of it's not just generally good enough to try and capture one idea, but try a, an iterative thing. Try looking at different ways of looking at the same object. Because uh, you can be surprised if it's just a dandelion. There might be 50 compositions of awe-dropping beauty that can happen just by moving your camera around the subject and realizing that there's different ways to sort of illuminate the scene. So photography has definitely been a huge thing. I'm going to buzz through most of my slides because uh, I have a lot of them. I like to kind of comfort myself with a lot of material. 
But then there's a lot of things that I like to share with people. Um, and a lot of them are these ethos that I kind of um, put benchmarks to each of, my pre or each of the chapters in my presentation. One of the ones that I love to always have in most of my presentations, I don't know if Tom Green's here, he's seen me present probably seven or eight times. And Tom can attest that I have probably put this in every single one of my presentations. And it is because I love it so well. It identifies the individual that I am. I just love working hard. This is one of the first projects I had as a designer. I didn't know anything about the animation programs that I was working with, but I had a vision. I had an idea. I knew what I wanted to accomplish. There was this poem that spoke about walking together what remains, and it's this remnants of things moving around. And if anyone knows Flash and knows timeline animation, they know I had no idea what the hell I was doing inside that application. <laughs> But I knew I wanted to create something beautiful. I wanted to create something amazing. And so I just sat down and with my stubbornness tried to hack it out and move the letters around. It just was something that inspired me to push. Um, and that same push has been driving me to learn about technology. As a result of doing that, I wanted to make sure I understood what the technology was doing and I tried to learn as much as possible. And in that process of trying to learn, I've also tried to make sure that I've had this teacher mentality. I mean, both my parents were teachers, roughly. My mom was a teacher, my dad was a pastor. Um, and I always felt this like desire to share what I had learned. So I, as I would learn, I would try and go to conferences and show people it's not that hard. And in the back of my mind, I was always keeping sort of this marker as to how I was doing physically. And I, I don't think I could have gotten to this spot where I was writing out code to animate objects on a stage until I understood how I was doing it physically. So I had to go through that heartache to get to this point where I realized there's got to be an easier way to do it. And then when I got to this, I understood various lines and algorithms and sl slowly started to pull it together. Uh, here I'm just taking a ball and putting it on the screen and adding a few attributes for it to follow the mouse. And the thing that's important is that you can't just do that. You can't just say, follow my mouse, because following my mouse is a very organic reaction. You need to add variables in there. That's where I'm adding this AX, AY with variables of div and friction. And they're just three different values that kind of cascade this linear action into a more organic structure. But our lives are like that. If I wanted to move a point with a, move a stick, moving a point to a point, I'm going to have a very linear reaction. But if I think about my arm, my arm has my shoulder, my elbow, my wrist, my fingers and digits, and all that causes an organic reaction. And so the mo most of my drawing code that I've been working on has that same embodiment. Uh, experience matters. I only added this because I, I was going through my photos last night and realizes that this also identifies my, my sort of way in which I've approached creativity as well. This is my son, um, my oldest son. And it was just a warm, sunny day. And he decided to sit down on the steps. And he looked at this flower. And this flower looked beautiful. And he tried to taste the flower. And he realized that flower tasted really bad. I need to spit that out. And he's never ate a flower again. And my second son, I never let grow a mullet either. Um, <laughs> Experience matters. I mean, it's the things that you learn in that process that you realize, I'm not going to do that again. But I understood the value of what, what happened there. Um, and not knowing is exciting. I mean, this is probably one of the biggest things that got me motivated to learn anything. It's just the fact that there was mountains of stuff that I had no knowledge of. And I just wanted to learn as much as possible. Uh, and much like my sketchbook that I would go to to draw, uh, I would go to this digital sketchbook and I would start with particle emitters. And then I'd get projects where someone said, do you know how to move a car around a screen? I said, sure, but I didn't. Uh, I tried to figure out, well, how does a camera move? How does this car park? I eventually tried to figure out all these little parts, just bit by bit, trying to figure out, well, what's a 3D perspective? And I would do all sorts of hacks to make it possible. And then in those hacks, I would then pull myself away and go, OK, for the next project, I really want to figure out what that 3D engine was like. So I take particles and put them in space and move them around. And I could use frameworks and classes and things that would already do this for me. But then I would be negating myself this education of understanding, well, these points are in space, and I'm trying to put these triangles together. Why are they occluding each other? Then you have to figure out how to depth sort a bunch of triangles. 
And this is a guy that got D's and everything, but I loved when I could visualize it. I could put it in front of me and go, this is my Sudoku. This is my puzzle for the day. Why is it doing this thing that it's doing? And I, I've always just loved this not knowing. Uh, and then I would eventually apply it to projects. And immediately I would find instances where, oh, you want a car driving around a globe, I would do that. And eventually this turns into a, a piece for Time Magazine. Um, but the interesting thing about um, even what I learned in the process for the cars is that I understood the ways in which objects needed to hit detect. I knew the code that was in there because I wrote it myself. It might not have been the clearest or best gaming code, but I knew where the points of interaction were happening and what was the balance between them. And for time, I knew how that globe was working, and then I made it connect to another interaction that I was doing with just images floating around a screen. So everything, you know, informs the other thing. You know, everything informs the next part of the process. And so I've always been into try and play and repeat. And sometimes I get overwhelmed with the ideas of marketing projects. And so I, I take a step back and look at the photography that I've done and try to figure out how can I apply the things that I enjoy about photography, about capturing color and capturing composition and apply it to these programmatic things. And so I just start very simply with, okay, let's take an object, slap it on the screen, and then pull the color from behind it. And you start to create these very filtery type effects, but as you start to um, mess with the size and scale of objects, you start to create more abstract expressions. And I really like this. I mean, I, I've just continued to play, um, pushing that a little bit further into not just simple objects, here is a piece that I ended up creating lines, and the lines created ribbons, and then the ribbons then connected to the sound that was playing. And so then it was like, okay, well, how can I push that a little bit further into my artwork? So here I took an image. Oops, I gotta go back and jump ahead. Let's see if it'll auto play. Magic, magic, come my way, please. There we go. So my wife. The only way I get to do projects late at night is if I incorporate my wife into it, and then she's like, oh, that's beautiful, that's nice, and way to go. And I'm like, yeah. No, she is beautiful, and I love incorporating her in my work, but it definitely gives me a reason to keep working hard at night. Um, so then now I, I was like, okay, I have these ribbons and these forms that are moving around. I, I like the abstract, but I really want to get more literal. I want to figure out ways in which... I can explicitly pull details out of stuff. So I built out this system that allowed me to, as I drew slowly, would cause more detail. But as I drew quickly, it would cause these large sort of gestural, sculptural reactions to it. And that allowed me to then design a composition that had a little bit more of my artistic vision into it and less about what, what the exact image was. And that part informed something else that I was working on. Um, in this piece, I just sort of called Journey, but it's reflective of an experience that I had when I was very young, uh, exposed to some recreational hallucinogenics. Um, and I would not condone this, and I always make sure that my crowd is of a pre above minor stage. But the amazing thing that happened for me is that the experience that I had First taking one hit of acid and then realizing nothing affected me and then I took four more hits of acid and holy shit, my world exploded on me. Um, there is some crazy stuff in our brains that we have no idea already exists. And if you look at people like Tim Leary and all that kind of stuff, they, they have obviously tried to document that. And I don't condone drug use, but I do condone this idea of looking at your mind or your ability as not something that you've confined yourself to believe in, but rather something that you have no idea of its potential and don't try and tell yourself what it is because it's, it's beyond our reckoning and it's beyond our understanding. Uh, and most of the time, I'm just trying to release that desire for visuals to you know, come up. And... So the, this is the part where I, I sort of tag this process as the journey, because for me, the journey had finally begun. I was finally creating things that I would be willing to hang on my wall.
And I just really love that, like, there, there's nothing there. There is a photograph, and there's all these objects moving around, and you can probably explain it with math and all that kind of stuff. But what you see there is what you brought there. And I, I love that element to it, that it's what you see that's important. So I've gone down this path of just trying to figure out how to express emotions and thoughts and colors and shapes and forms in this space of abstract art that allow people to just kind of reminisce that like this was taken from a bunch of spring photographs. And I think it just has that feeling to it. And that this is, you know, I mean, to give it meaning actually is probably to do it a disservice. It's better for you to kind of see it as that. Um, but for me, it was this excitement of like, oh, now this journey's starting. And I started to bring in old elements that I was doing with ribbons to this new system of objects moving around in a three-dimensional sphere and incorporating it, but then disconnecting it. Do what you love, and no, money is not important, unless you live in San Francisco, and holy shit, money is really fucking important. Um, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't be swearing. But no, nothing is important other than doing what you absolutely love and dearly love doing. And um, uh, one of the moments in which I realized, oh, this, this art thing is actually taking off is that I was doing all these pieces and people were now recognizing me for it and saying, hey, Eric, we have this thing we'd like for you to you know, contribute to. And you're like, yeah, 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 I'd love to do it. This would be great. And then I take on the project and you know, they, they show me some piece that I've done and they go like, yeah, could you do this? We'll pay you like amount of money. I'm like, absolutely, that's easy. That'll be like an hour. And it's like, no, pump the brakes. This did not work out as well as I thought it because they started to ask me for very specific things. Like we want the ribbon to move from here to here, but be thick and then go thin and then have a few little particles there. And I'm like, um, my system doesn't do that. Um, but I'll program it to do that. So I'd sit down and go, OK, I'll, I'll write this out so that when I hit this key on the keyboard, it'll make the particles be smaller, and the ribbon will be thicker. And then I'd do another piece and send it over, and they'd be like, yeah, that's great. Could you move this over here and that over there? And I'm like, Zzz. I don't know how to move things around here. Um, but I could add more values, or I could change things up. And they, they'd give me feedback of like, we like the salmon color, but we don't like the yellow color. So then I'd figure out ways in which to to mix and match them in my keyboard. And eventually my keyboard became much like a piano to me and I was starting to play it much like that, where the one through zero uh, number pads were actually different colors or different images. So if I wanted more blue or I wanted more red, I would explicitly pick out the, the image that had that. And if you saw at the beginning of this video, you saw them quickly flickering. Then I had values for being able to change the, the speed in which they flickered or if they stayed on an image. And so then over time, I refined it almost like a drawing tool where I was like saying, I want this color and I want to stay on this, you know, this style, or I want the ribbon to have this amount of energy behind it. Um, and I learned probably more about myself in this process and refined sort of my design process as a result of it. And as a result of trying to enable someone else to incorporate their thinking to my designs. And that's important. You can't just live, like artists do that, where they live in a studio and they create art and then they throw it out to the world and the world says, we don't like it. Oh, I'm going to go back to my studio and create more art. But it's great to combine those efforts with someone else that can give you that feedback. And then that feedback informs what you should create in the next iteration. Don't design in a bubble. Don't build a boat in the basement. Um, and this is what I've been, uh, or this was the process that, are, that emerged. And this was for Nokia. And the, the thinking behind it is that they wanted the ribbons to feel like video moving and streaming. And they wanted non-visually understandable alphabets to represent texting. But they just generally wanted the energy of it. And I'd say over the course of two weeks, we finally honed this process. And you know, it was hard to even pick what we were finally going to use because we got so excited with what the end results were. Um, But I, I, I was tremendously happy with the results. And I put this on pillows and all sorts of other stuff because they only bought one. So that was great. Um, if you want to buy a pillow with that, the other patterns, uh, you, you certainly can. They're really cozy and cool. Um, oh, good. 
We're now getting to the, I can take a deep breath a little bit and talk to you about my TED experience. Um, this past winter, someone contacted me and said, uh, Ted is interested in having some portraits made. Would you be interested in doing them? Heck yeah, I'd love to do them. Um, they said, okay, we'll get back to Ted. And Ted came back and said, cool, maybe we'll do it. January came, February came. Uh, March is around the corner. We're not really going to be able to do this. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. We think you could do it. But obviously now there's not enough time to do it. So maybe just, you know, do something simple. We just have 60 images and we want to be able to do like a posterized effect. We like what uh, Shepard Ferry did with a bomb. Obviously you can't do that much. Um, but, you know, see what you can do. And so I, I came up with a couple of these, and they're like, yeah, but we want something very simple. So then I went up with this, and they're like, yeah, that's cool. That's perfect. Let's do that. And I'm like, ah, okay. I did a few more. I came up with some different patterns. They eventually gave me a, you know, an authentic um, TED emblem, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's not part of the story. But then I was like, ah, I really want these textures to be better. I love Shepard Fairy. I love what I could potentially put to this project. So then I designed this and I sent that to them. And they're like, that's great. Can you still do it in the time? We only have like a week and a half before it has to go to press. I'm like, yeah, that's no problem. It's only 60. Holy cow. Um, okay. I came up with a system. So I had this system and I knew John Maeda, uh, Stefan Sagmeister, these people I understood and knew. But I was creating portraits for these other people that I had no idea about. Um, like there's this woman, Amy Mullins. And I, I was like, okay, I gotta find out who these people are doing their portraits. Uh, so I watched her video. She doesn't have legs, but you can obviously see she has legs. She has prosthetic legs. And she embraced that. That was part of her thing. That was her thing for Ted to say, I've embraced the fact that I don't have you know, legs below the knees, but as a result, I can change my height on any given day. I was like, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> How can I just do a texture? She's gotta have something special. So I ended up actually doing a sketch just to see, okay, what will this look like? So I did a sketch of her jumping and I did a sketch of her legs and I started to put it into her image. And then I looked through and started to do sketches for like, what would the different Ted's be, or the Ted presenters or hosts. I, I wanted to have them to have something special. I wanted to do different special things for different people. A week and a half is quickly melting away. How the hell can I do this with 60 people? Well, shit. If I do this, I am going to be so much more excited about this project than if I didn't. So I spent every waking hour trying to make individual elements for each individual presenter. And no one probably really even noticed it because it was on a screen this size and the elements were very, very tiny. But it mattered to me and it mattered a heck of a lot. So I sweated as much as I could and put these pictures up on my wall and every day tried to go, okay, how can I make that one a little bit better, that one a little bit better? And uh, it's definitely been one of the pieces I'm, I'm most proud of this year. I'll let that play. So you can see all the little details. And uh, the screen's a little washed out, but look at this guy who talked about goldfish going around a pond. And I was like, okay, we're gonna make some goldfish. And she talked about handing out of a hat. Um, and this guy, I forget, I can't see it that well. I got to look on here. But she was talking about abstract patterns and, and patternation. He was talking about this cube that was different. I mean, as your eye would look at it, he had fish. And this thing just wrapped me in, much like walking together what Remain did. And she, yeah. it's just so much fun putting yourself into a project. And it's so much fun sharing those things because it, it translates. I had so much fun on that. Um, thanks. And I had never gone to TED before, and they invited me, and I was really happy. So that was cool, too, because shit, those, those, those tickets are expensive. Um, so whenever you get lost, you're like, whoa, I don't know what to do next. I find myself in these like moments of, I got six projects going on. They're all kind of boring me out. But 
I need to find something to like get my brain spiced up. I always rely on foundations, things that I learned in the past and decided, okay, let's reinvestigate them. Let's reinvigorate that process. So here's one that I always love presenting, which talks about mirroring. I'll turn this down. I absolutely, like in design, I never was a big fan of mirroring anything, even though it always had this pleasing effect. If you take one crappy logo and repeat it a thousand times, it doesn't look like such a shitty logo anymore. Um, <laughs> but if you take artwork and flip it, it kind of becomes nice. But th this was the system, is that as I was making this ribbon on the side, of, on one side, I was flipping it, or I was deciding randomly, let's flip it every time, or let's flip it to the left, let's flip it to the right, let's not do anything at all. And as a result, you ended up with this structure that had balance, but not, not mirrored balance. And then I just went crazy. I decided, okay, let's make it so that they can connect the grids and let's change out the undulation. Here's the whole learn, play, repeat philosophy uh, of just going and trying things out. And I'll just let a few of these play. I know I'm. Most of these end up kind of looking a little Buddha-like, which I don't mind. They're fun. Um, oh, they got more audio for me. There's my Buddha. Okay, and then sometimes you just got to slow down. Um, one of the times I did this, I was working on a problem where I had this really weird kink that was happening every time I was drawing. I was like, these kinks are driving me nuts. So then I slowed down every algorithm and actually sped up the amount of time in which it was drawing to the screen. And I was like, whoa, wherever I was going, let's take a detour because this puppy is looking pretty. And... I love that. I love when it starts to iterate, and, or not iterate, build up. It builds up in this way that's like drawing. It starts to shade, and it kind of it detaches itself from this idea of it being digital anymore. And I just absolutely love this. So slowing down my process and taking a detour was really valuable. I just, even taking out color was something that was like, oh, I took out color because I was being scientific. But as a result, I realized color was kind of distracting sometimes. Limits and invitations. Limits are the best invitations to do something, especially when it came to like that TED piece. As soon as I understood that that was going to be incredibly hard, I was like, bing, I want to do this. I want to do this thing. Another moment in which I remember that in my life was I had an ad agency come to me and they were like, hey, Eric, could you do a jellyfish in code and under 10K? I was like, eh, maybe, I don't, I don't know, um, but I'm kind of busy right now. And they're like, yeah, your friend said that it was impossible, and uh, you can't do it under 10K. Really? He said that it was impossible and you can't do it under 10K? I am sold. I am doing that. I'm dropping everything that I'm doing, and I am taking this puppy on. I don't have the jellyfish here for me, but it turned out really good, and it was only because that challenge was there. It was only that, like, hey, hey I'm going to be able to tell my friend, like, you couldn't do the jellyfish in under 10K. I got it done. Um, uh, those kinds of things are really good. They're fun. Um, Wired came to me, uh, it was a while ago now, it's 2008, I believe, and they say, we, you know, I love your artwork, we'd like to incorporate it in our event, um, and we wanted to see how big you could do it. And instead of coming back and saying, well, the largest I can do is 40 inches by 40 inches, I decided, what's the largest I can print on my printer? My printer was able to do 12 foot by 40 inches, and I said, okay, how do I figure that out? And, you know, through a bunch of technical hurdles, eventually I figured it out and was able to present them. Oh, I got all these things here. Um, so this is a history of like, uh, here's the image at regular scale and that, that's related to the larger scale. Anyways, I'll just let these play because I really want to be quick. 
We can turn these house lights down too as I'm kind of finishing up, if it's possible. It'll help the wash on the screen. And here are, you know, much more slowed down process. Every time I moved that ribbon across the screen, it was one or two seconds. So each composition you see here took two or three hours of me just kind of meticulously moving my hand around the screen, recognizing, okay, it's, it's pulling out the detail, it's stamping down the values, and eventually I would save out all the textures. But it was fun. It was great to like investigate at such a large scale and to print these out was so wonderful. And I sent them to Wired and they're like, that's great. Can you make a video? What the fuck? Can I make a video? Okay, I think I could, but that just took me four hours. Why not? Okay, well, let's go do them again. And this is, oh, to give you a reference of size, this is what these ended up looking like, um, fairly large. So then I re-recorded it. I took that limit, the limitation, and said, sure, why not? It's wired. Let's go redo these again. And it gave me an opportunity to do an even better job. And I always like to tie music that I'm listening to at the time to the songs. And it was really hard to drive my car slow when I listened to that song. <laughs> um, but boy, did I love it. It connected. I am totally going to skip Painterly because it's beautiful, but I have no time to show it. I invite people to go look online. Um, it just was a process in which I said, don't just be digital. Like embrace what Painterly elements could pot potentially be and take that further. Uh, similarly, you're not going to see Colors of Nature, um, a beautiful piece, a wonderful music, uh, where I embraced a little bit more of the photography that I was doing and being more explicit with the, the compositions that I was doing um, so that it was referential to the, to the colors in nature as well as the compositions in nature, too. Um, and I ended up exhibiting this throughout the US and Europe for a little while. Beautiful pieces. Um, uh, hard rock you're not going to see. Um, <laughs> sorry, it talks about the... Oh, I'd love to show it to you. It, I failed miserably on this project, and I love showing it because um, this company came to me, and they're like, Eric, you're rocking it. You're doing like this generative stuff. We love it. Just go do and have fun. And I like went and had fun, and I was thinking about hard rock and what could I do as an animation. And whenever they did, had... A, um, music playing that they didn't have a video. They wanted to put this up in all the cafes and music, cafes, casinos, and restaurants. Um, and I was like, okay, I just want it to be like this Aurora Borealis type thing where it's like people with their, you know, lighters in a crowd just kind of lighting stuff up. And they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. And I showed it to them and they're like, that sucks. We really don't like that. Um, so then I'm like, OK, I embraced that and kept pushing it forward. And they're like, no, oh, we can just do a slideshow. Time's running out. I'm like, you're not just doing a slideshow. I'm making this thing look good. So eventually, I just evolved the system and started to incorporate ways in which I could pull the image in. Uh, and I'll jump ahead. So what it became was this thing that I, I, I love about going to a bar. And you know, I don't play bar trivia, but I like this idea that there's a screen in, in front of me, and it gives me this guessing game. Who killed Abraham Lincoln? And it's like A, B, C, or D. and then. B goes away, and then C goes away, and then D's just left. And you're like, oh, cool. Um, that's what I wanted to create with this. I wanted it to be a slideshow that these ribbons would kind of dance around the composition and pull out color and make it kind of be this teaser. Oh, what it is? What is it? I don't know what it is. Oh, OK, that's the car from YouTube. That was neat. That's fun. So then I did 70 or 80 of these. And I, at that time, I just set it up to run and go. I wasn't, I wasn't making these individually. But it was, it was fun because I was turning it on its head. And it was definitely a struggle to make it happen. 
Oh my goodness, I have no time. Uh, okay, three minutes. Make me a brush. Um, my son is now four, and part of being four is going to preschool, and part of being going to preschool is having parents come to visit and teach about what they do for a living. Um, so make me a brush is now ingrained in my brain as to what these kids wanted me to do. I slowly came to the class, and I showed them the application, and I said, hey, kids, would you want to be a brush? One of the coolest things that I was doing with my son was actually taking pictures of like Batman and Superman and turning them into brushes and being explicit with the textures. And everyone said, yeah, I want to be a brush. Yeah, make me a brush, rock out. So I took all the kids and for you know an entire hour, I heard, make me a brush. Can you make me a brush? Make me a brush. So I took all of them. I can't do it for you guys. You guys have a whole other thing going on today. Um, Make me a brush. So we made them a brush, and we made all sorts of crazy patterns with them. And here's the video of that. And if you saw Michael's presentation this morning, he was talking about all the drawing things that we've been doing, and this is one of them. And we are super, super jazzed about it, and I have no idea if I'm allowed to show you it at all. Um, <laughs> because you might not be under the right NDA. But who cares? Um, <laughs> Neither were the preschoolers. Um, so this is exciting because now with all these drawing applications and things that we're doing, make me a brush. Heck yeah. Finally, I've been using Photoshop and Illustrator forever and I just wanted that process of making a brush to get more streamlined. And we got tablets, we've got fingers, we have so much fun that we can do that now we started to do make me a brush. And then one of these little hacks that happened I was drawing it, and any time you do the middle line, it would repeat it. But then what happens if we change that up and move the tail and body to the other side? He just becomes a little piece of iconography that he can move all over the place. Make me a brush. And this is my son. He will not stop wearing this Batman costume. It stinks. But... <laughs> He wanted to be made a brush, and now we have all sorts of attributes for how you can make a brush, and this one's where you can stretch. And yeah, uh, that was my experience with them. Oh, I'm out of time. Um, and yeah, naturally the evening of uh, going to a launch event for all these drawing applications, we were showing off that, that app there, and naturally everyone that came up to the app was like, make me a brush. So. It, it's become a, a synonymous thing. And the brushes themselves kind of, you know, you're able to do splatter brushes and different kinds of oil maskings. Uh, the interesting thing that I did here was, oh, I think I have a slide for it, was that I made the crease actually a brush and then I used Napoleon to then make, or what's it called, slide, uh, to make a straight line with the crease. And I've done this with torn edges. Uh, here's just doing different pencil sketches. Uh, this is with my wife, which gave me more free time when we were on like her birthday uh, to draw her out. Um, yeah, honey, I'm doing research. Okay, I gotta show you this one thing. Can I have like three minutes? Okay, you gotta. If you have a boss that actually draws, so like Michael this morning, he's my boss. I was working on uh, the Adobe Creativity Anthem, and or I wasn't, he was, and so was. Um, a few others, and they wanted to do a thing around creativity. And you'll recognize this because now this has been taken on as the, the thing for education, which is awesome. I uh, love this graphic. Um, so my boss came to me and he said, we're wanting to create this anthem around creativity. You know, here's a few words. He did a voiceover to it. If you have a boss that's big into drawing, definitely draw him. Um, so I said, this is cool. I have some people that I think could actually make this thing come to life in a different way. Um, let me reach out to this guy that I know. I've been speaking to someone, his name's Kyle Cooper. He's done the intro to Seven and Iron Man, and all this kind of crazy stuff. We've bumped into each other at conferences over the years and always thought like, cool, that'd be nice to do something. So I shared with him the voiceover. He shared with me this picture of his son. I shared him this picture of my son made you know, I made these Buzz Lightyear wings with duct tape and cardboard boxes. I mean, we just love our kids and we love that level of creativity that they put towards it. And that was what this thing embodied. It embodied the amount of energy that we all have as creatives growing up, not really being sure as to whether people understand us or not, but knowing that we have this, this burning inside of us. So we created this video. Um, actually, 
He said yes, then he said no. He presented it to his uh, class or to his studio. I tried to do the nice, respectful thing and just said, thank you. you got, you're a wonderful guy. You're, you're the type of person this industry needs. And eventually that kind of probably leaned on him a little bit. And he said, let's build it. And I love, you know, I had a much larger story. I just really want to get to this video. Um, I eked out as many hours as I could, uh, including the babysitting hours that I had for my son. Uh, that is the diaper and wipes on the table next to the, the video that was being created. So I'm going to just let it play. And as loud as you want it to be. Can you guys turn it up a little bit? I can't thank you enough for having me. I'm sorry it was so rapid, but I think we all got the gist of it. And, I... and Eric, if you would like to take a few questions, sure. we actually do have a little bit of time. We have a, a piece that got oh, canceled. Oh, you, you want me to show more stuff? I could go. Well, no. we, we, we have about five minutes that okay. we can give no, you No, 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 no. Yeah, that would be great to chat. And then we have a five minute of fame that's going to follow um, follow you. But our next sessions don't start back up until four. So if you, if you have a question for Eric, please go to the microphone. So a lot of us know the old adage about uh, you never really get done with creativity. You just hit a deadline. But when you're working in a space where you're creating digitally at the time, how do you know when you're done? <sighs> Usually if I've gone too far, I kind of go like, ah, oh, it was so much nicer, like, you know, a week or two before. But no, done is when, you know, the plates have to be served. I mean, it's chopped. It's like, for me, I feel like I'm generally just trying to put as much of myself into the, you know, into the piece. And then it, it does need to get out the door. Um, so I, I don't ever see anything as be, ever being done. And that's usually how I frame my presentations is it's like, it's just one thing that carries over. From one to another, and if I don't get it done now, I get it on to the next thing. Iteration. Yes, which gets really ugly and messy. Um, but I've been slowly trying to go through and like document some of that stuff out as well. Sure. Do we have any? If if you need to ask a question, I need you to come to the microphone so that our online um, audience can hear the question. So if you had <laughs> if you had one minute to uh, talk to high school students or or middle school students or college students, I guess, uh, but one minute to tell them uh, how to think about creativity or how to think about how to step forward into a chance, what would you say? Um, 
I generally try and look at creativity as not necessarily um, a thing that you try and achieve, but rather a, a state that you enable and that you open. And a lot of the stuff that I tried to present today was about how I can scaffold as much of that process and knowledge to the point where the scaffolding is built up enough that I can now like kind of let myself be free. And creativity is that, that open state. So if I'm speaking to someone sort of early education, I would say the things that you're going to learn, you have no idea how the, they will apply, but they will apply. And as long as you are engaged in that process, they will you know, reap greater value than if you were to just trudgingly go through the education process and acquire the knowledge so that it can be you know, put back out at test time. Acquire the knowledge and understand why that knowledge is being acquired. And that was probably the biggest aha moment in my own existence, in my own life, is that I was acquiring knowledge because I knew it empowered me. And that's the thing that I, I always try and get across to early education, is that education empowers you. It scaffolds you. It builds you up and gives you the necessary nutrients to be creative. Don't look at creativity as something that you need to perfect and improve. Look at process. Process is a very good <laughs> sort of aside to creativity. If I were to teach and grade, I would grade process over like creative results. Um, and then just try and hone that over time. Create a cycle out of it. Make it educate so that I can be creative. Educate so I can be creative. Educate so I can be creative. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I'm interested in your experience of school as a Participant and uh, for good or for good or for otherwise, and uh, just if there's anything you can remember, I'm not suggesting you compare yourself to your son who's four, but you well, can remember that. Way. Let's line all my professors up, <laughs> and they will all tell you uh, participation. Well, Eric wasn't participating. I didn't understand that it was valuable. I mean, that is really the crux of it, and I think as a result, I knew that. That was the danger with my mind, is that I knew when applied, I could conquer and understand any concept. But I never applied it. So as a result, I said, ah, math, it'll be for another time. Chemistry, ah, it'll be for another time. And eventually I started to get interested in biology and actually got into genetics and things like that. But I didn't even realize that I should embrace some of the elements that I was learning there. Because as a result, I would go into object-oriented programming, which talked about inheritance. And then I realized... That connects, that connects to genetics and sort of a lot of the scientific understandings around that apply to other things. And so my participation in education, I would go backwards and potentially try and realize that they will connect and it's going to be, get harder the longer I sort of negate it. And I, I think because I negated it, I tried to compensate for that absence. And maybe that helped me. Maybe that was a good thing. So how do you know if you're like following your own inspiration? How do you know if you're following your own inspiration? Try and stay away from everyone else's. I, but I'm not like there, there is the TED piece and I made explicit references to Shepard Ferry because that was an explicit reference that was being made to me in, in the sort of briefing. That was fine. I'm, I'm cool with even other people, like that's how we talk. We, you know, we go to a restaurant and we only order the food that we understand. And that's how we eat. But you've got to be willing to experiment. Not everyone's willing to experiment. Um, so I'm willing to take what the order is, but then understand that given my filter, my interests will always try and push it a little bit into a different territory. And being willing to understand that, like, go copy the heck out of someone because... If you do a good enough job, you'll understand how they did it more so than like how to repeat it. And then as a result, you'll go, okay, well now how do I incorporate my own things to it? Like I was a huge fan of David Carson, but I would look at the work that he did. I would, you know, replicate it, but I always would get distracted and go and, you know, do something slightly different as a result. And I, I wouldn't be afraid of replication. It informs a lot. It's an educational tool. So let's just do the last two questions, and then we're going to go ahead and have Kevin come up and get ready for your five minutes of fame so we can be on time. 
<laughs> so you started to touch on something um, that is from similar to what I teach in my classroom in a book called On Filmmaking, and its big thing is process, not product. But then from the other side, as a teacher trying to get your students to embrace a process versus get frustrated because they don't have a product they're aiming towards, mm -hmm. how does your how is your process affected by not knowing what your product's going to be? Uh, th there is that certain anxiety that you, you, you get knowing that you do have to get to an end, but I've done it enough times that I realize like as long, usually as long as you put time behind something and work hard, you'll get a result. You'll get somewhat close to the result that you want. Um, it depends on how long you want to kind of keep pushing it. And I think the thing that I've tried to keep in my brain is to never stick too hard to a vision. Like on the onset of a project, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this. And it never is that. It's always something else that finally emerges. And the thing that I try and educate other people about is that the coolest things in most projects happen in the process. They don't happen as a result of premeditated ideation. Like everyone kind of is like, yeah, I had that idea or I had this idea. And it's like... It, the best ideas happen in that moment of trying to create. And uh, other than just kind of putting the blinders on and realizing, you know, something good is going to come out of it. I recently read a book by Ed Catmull, and he talked about the tunnel. Ed Catmull's from Pixar. And one of the philosophies they had is that you might not see the light at, the other, at either end of the tunnel, and you'll start to panic, and you'll realize, oh, no, I can't, you know, I can't make it. And it's like you got to decide, are you getting out of the tunnel, or are you going to push forward? And I've always found that, you know, even if you don't think you can get out of it, you will. Because <clears throat> what I wanted to ask for you, it's not exactly a question, but uh, that tunnel part, I was going to ask you, I really respected the way you mentioned, you know, here's my son in his diaper and here's my wife. And, you know, on the creative side, how do you instill a faith in your students that to fight sometimes? Does that make sense? Uh, you know, and how do you integrate this? And you know, you've got all these other things going on. How do you prioritize it so that you keep working on that creative scaffolding? And does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, finding the time, I guess, is essentially what you. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's why I draw my wife, and I'm like, please, honey, let me work. Um, I just love doing it, and I'm not going to be one, like, we should have my wife literally here, and she's going to be like, Eric does not know how to balance his time or anything else. That's why I handle his finances. Um, but it's just sort of like, that's reality. Um, I love to take on projects. I love to do as much as I can. I don't know where that comes from, but I enjoy it. At the same point, I have to balance. I have to take on, like, I've got wonderful projects that are going on, and I'm having to constantly move them from one back burner to another. Um, and so stay organized, stay focused. Don't, don't see the forest. I mean, it, it's easy to just go, oh, there's too much ahead of me. But as long as you take it in di digestible elements, and I think that was even like the walking together what remains. Like, I didn't realize how much I kind of screwed myself by, like, just starting out by going, okay, I'm going to animate this piece and animate this piece and move it up and down. And eventually you realize, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a ton of work. But you didn't, I didn't see it as that. And I think that's how I get myself into those, into those things. And then I just realize, okay, to get out of this, it's the same process. Just don't see this big project that has to get done. Just see what has to get done in the next 15 minutes. And that's maybe... I, yeah. Thank you. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you.